Welcome back to the Beat the Often Path podcast, the podcast where we showcase unusual success stories from highly unusual individuals to help us all think outside the box during these crazy times. My guest today is a very talented dude and longtime friend, Chongor Guns. Chongor was responsible for running and building the award-winning YouTube show Pensado's Place for many years, doing hundreds of episodes. This show has long been the staple of the audio engineering world and it has achieved impressive notoriety. Chongor himself is a multi-talented digital expert. He's a music producer, an audio engineer, a videographer, editor, show producer, and so, so much more. He's truly a modern day renaissance man and I'm thrilled to have him here on the show. So with that, Chongor Guns. Hey. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, ah. welcome to the podcast. The man screaming in my ear right now, Mr. Chongor. <laughs> Chongor, how you doing, buddy? <laughs> Good, Ross. Man, it's we're coming full circle here. I feel like it was just yesterday when you came to visit Pensado's place in the show for the first time, and now I'm on your podcast. So, <laughs> right. man. So explain a little bit about how this is full circle, which it, it, which it truly is. It really is. Yeah. yeah, completely full circle. So basically, I mean, you and I met maybe back in 2016, I think when you were still working with our Armada and uh, you had come to visit the show with uh, Maruha, and you sat in for a taping, had a great time, and from there, our uh, relationship and friendship just kind of blossomed and grew where, you know, if it was NAM season, all right, come down to NAM, let's have a good time. Consult Awards, all right, you're coming. Let's make sure it's gonna be a good time. And, you know, now it's 2021, we've just spent a year through the pandemic, and we're on, your podcast now, which yeah. man, when you launched, I was so thrilled to see the graphics you're doing, everything. They're just, uh, man, it's incredible. And the guests, super <laughs> nice. fun. Thank you, man. I really appreciate that. It means a lot coming from you. And especially because you've done such great work. And I think we should preface this whole conversation before we launch into some of the nitty gritty. Um, meeting you was a very chance encounter for us, but a great one because... You're coming to a place like L.A. All you know is that it's going to be this cold, unforgiving city where they're going to chew you up and spit you out. And it's just going to be some kind of you know, you're in for some sort of nightmare helicopters. You yeah, don't know exactly. what you're in for. You know, the industry is <laughs> something you know nothing about. And we got connected and I, you were surely one of the first people who were just genuinely open and nice and just you know, far nicer and more open than you really had any reason to be. And you brought me in and to the show and, and Pensado's Place, which, for those who don't know, is the definitive YouTube show, podcast, call it what you will, for audio engineers, which has been a gigantic passion of both of ours forever, basically. So to be on the set of Dave Pensado, one of the great legends of audio engineering of all time, on a show that you were running at the time was just an incredible yeah. honor. And that was, that was the first time that I felt like, okay, like, cool, good things can happen out here too. It's not only violence and helicopters and <laughs> horrible things. Like there are positive things that can happen out here. So I thank yeah, you that for means that. So much. I thank yeah. you for that. Well, well, you're, you're welcome a thousand, a thousand times. And hearing that like warms my heart. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, man. Thank you. It's, uh, and you even got yeah. me a Pensado's Place mug, which I cherished for years until I just broke it, like, at the start of the pandemic. I, I shed a tear. I was like, oh, man, I shouldn't have been. But I used it, like, every day. <laughs> so it got plenty of mileage. Uh, hey, the daily mug. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, God, that was it. I felt like such a boss with that mug. Um, but, yeah, so anyways, I think every it, the relevance to this podcast for the unusual success stories and whatnot is that you are clearly a man of many talents, and you always have been. And Pensado's Place is a very highly regarded YouTube show, and it's a YouTube show unlike a lot of others in that the production value is considerably higher and was considerably higher than really pretty much anything at the time that I was aware of. You're talking about multi-cameras, you're talking about studio lighting, studio space. Obviously, it's hosted and run by audio engineers, so the audio has to be impeccable. Just a lot of moving parts. It, it was, yeah, pristine. It was a real show, and you ran it all. So talk to us a little bit about that experience and how you got involved. So, all right, if we're, let's digress a little bit to go backwards. That's all we ever uh, do. 
Yeah, right. The audio engineers are like, back, remember, back, remember that. Let's back up to 1984. <laughs> like, I remember doing this one reverb set of time, bro. And it was just amazing. It was just yeah. sensitive. sensitive. <laughs> yes. But uh, basically, to, to, go, to go back to it all, um, I originally linked up with uh, Pensado's place actually at the Art Institute, which is the audio college. I went to, um, in high school, I had developed a passion for electronic music, beat making, DJing, and I had been making my own productions and I wanted to learn how to essentially make them better. So I went to school at at the Art Institute for that. And maybe about a year or so into the curriculum, uh, I had discovered this new web show called Consolos Place. I think around the time I discovered it was maybe like, episode 20 or 30 so very early on i had been watching it religiously well the by the stroke of the universe whatever all of this is the show that i was consuming online now moved to the art institute where i was going to school and was filming there weekly so i remember just being like a complete fan just watching from outside of the director's glass like into from the hallway just being like wow if there's any way i could work on the show or be any kind of just part of it i would be so thrilled and uh the opportunity came up to actually work on the show and i started off as the kind of broadcast engineer so basically running the sound uh making sure all the mics are good the recording is happening good etc cetera, etc cetera. and from there um I remember Herb telling me one time, he's like, man, are you the only one that's like doing a lot of stuff on here? I'm like, no, but like if I see something that needs to get done, I'm just going to do it so we can make the production fast and that happen faster. And basically Herb recognized that and, uh, or Herb and Dave both did. And they asked me to actually be part of the show. So while I'm still in college, I go from one week doing the broadcast engineering to the next week still in the class with like all the other classmates, but now I'm on the show. I'm I'm on, I stepped on the other side of the glass. And, you know, from there, it was just kind of uh, a snowball effect where eventually uh, Pensado's Place Time at the Art Institute came to a close. So when they decided to leave, I was the only student they actually ended up taking with them. And the responsibilities that Herb was giving me at the time just slowly increased 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 and by by the end of it um (laughs) we were basically like flying around the u.s doing events all across the country uh different pop-ups if we did an award show which we did a few of them the consado awards i was one of the co-producers on where basically herb and i would collaborate on how to bring this uh show to life and yep. it was just a complete amazing experience. Yeah. So. And, you know, I think for those who don't know, so obviously I'm a huge fan of audio engineering. Audio engineering is where you take bad sounding things and you make them sound good. The difference between a demo and a final record. It's the difference between something that has potential and the finished audio product. As in, this is what gets printed. This is what it's going to sound like. There are no changes. So the audio engineer is the last stop, pretty much, other than the mastering engineer, before it goes out to the public. So any mistakes need to be fixed. They need to make it bigger, wider, sweeter, better, more awesome, more everything. So it's a a lifelong pursuit. (laughs) Obviously, it's not something that you can just figure out. Um, And I want to preface this just real quick because I knew when you go way back pre-YouTube and all of that, Finding actual information about the art of audio engineering was really, really tough, really tough because there were secrets, but nobody wanted to share those secrets because that was the source of their career. So if somebody figured out a a better way to make a vocal more pristine or a better reverb setting, nobody shared that. So there'd be these books that would teach you a thing or two. Many of them were not very helpful or things that were very basic. Dave Pensato was the first person, and I remember when he did this, he shared an article that he actually took screenshots of his plugin settings, and he said, here is a setting that I used on Christina Aguilera's vocal for this song. And I remember just being like, oh my God, it was like the most valuable thing I'd ever seen, just learn. And, And there's one of the things that he used to reduce harshness in a vocal that I still use all the time. The C4 harshness, that blew my mind. 
just yeah, not the track, yes like one four whatever or like wherever you need to that single setting changed my life absolutely and i emailed him and i said i just want to say thanks for this expecting yeah. nothing in return i just i just want to say thanks it's really hard to find information you did this awesome thing so completely unexpected he emails me back this is pre his show i didn't even really know anything about him other than what he had done and he wrote just this really thoughtful long response an entire letter about you know keep going and the motivating and all of that stuff and he said by the way i'm working on something that you're really going to love i got this project coming it's going to be like a university for audio engineers but it's free and yeah. that ended up becoming his show Pensado's Place, which was the first of its kind YouTube show where he actually talked about all of the secrets, what he was using on projects, all of this stuff just completely opened up the floodgates of information. And I think just as importantly, he got guests on who also shared their secrets. And a lot of those guests are very hesitant to do that because they're also from a world where we got to keep it all close by. So so this is the significance of that show to people who are wondering, you know, now it's like, well, there's a million YouTube shows, a million podcasts, but what that show meant in that time to audio engineers was a lot. And the response that you had and that I had not knowing each other is a testament to that. Yeah, I feel. exactly. So I mean, it's kind of like we realized at the time where you know, now I, I I definitely feel like the I mean obviously you had influencers and all that stuff and it was a, a it was a way to you know it was a career choice and now um, or let me let me rephrase this I feel like the show gave uh, like a new lane for audio engineers and people in the music industry to brand themselves in a way that they hadn't brand themselves before because a lot of the duties were kind of behind the scenes. Like, you know, you'd be working in the studio, free social media, whatever, you, you know, you're not getting the info out. You're just kind of keeping your head down, working, doing your thing. Mm. But now with social media, everyone's self-branding and Sato's place was one of the first ones to really kind of, uh, I mean, like unveil the curtain, reveal the secrets and really just, uh, put all of these uh, craftsmen and women on the map. Yep. And now it's like, I mean, you, you have guys like ill, ill. I mean, I want to just give a shout out to ill mind really quick because I mean, we had him on the show. I don't know, maybe like 2018, 2019 could be wrong on that, but somewhere around there. And, you know, he went to, he was already here. He already had the black gift and, you know, now he did the NFT now he's launched his own coin. So it just, I mean, I love seeing people just uh, win and just kind of keep mm -hmm. the momentum going. And I really feel like a lot of these different, I mean, I feel like there's a new generation of audio influencers on YouTube. I mean, Definitely. you have like Kenny B, Bill Mines. Um, I mean, I'm, there's, there's so many of them that are streaming. Uh, Mike Dean, he's doing his new uh, mm -hmm. 422 album. And it's uh, really just paved the way. And also, yeah. I mean, think about all the lives that have been changed forever so from much. being able to learn the technical side of, of right. what your uh, favorite song, whatever is doing. But then you also learn the backstory of what that person was going through during all of that, which kind of uh, brings it all full circle where instead of us just kind of reading about accolades and victories that are people having, you're like, oh, wait, you were also dealing with stress when I was... Or you were also dealing with stress while you were doing all the vocals for this. It's like, wow, I had no idea. Like, you're an actual person. Like, you're not a robot. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that was really um, how, how do you want to say it? it? It's what broke through to the audience the most, where they they resonated with it. And I mean. The amount of people that, that, you know, any tip that you've gotten, if you're using a mix or any kind of job that you're doing, you know, that's like paying your bills and everything like that. So think about thinking about all the people's lives who have been affected for the better. So like, I think the show is probably at like over like 250 million minutes of watch time. So Crazy. to think that I had like an integral part of all that and all the lives that I have changed yeah. and 
27. How many, how many episodes yeah. did you do? How many episodes were you responsible for? Do you remember? Uh, so my roles changed kind of throughout, but during like the actual Just like being production a of, of it. Yeah. So being a part of like probably like over like 330, I think is what the IMDb is. That's a, yeah. So, I, that's what the IMDb says. Yeah. And yeah. You know, I, you know, I, I, I love it. It ticks all the boxes because it's a niche community. It's the thing that a lot of people don't know about, but there's a cause there and it's a cause people don't know about. And the cause is that this profession, which is an art form and the people who do it are artists. They were always seen yeah. as purely technical people that were like a footnote. You have the songwriter, you have the vocal, you have all this. And then technical, there's just a footnote of the person who engineered it. And everybody just thought, oh, yeah. like they're all interchangeable. It doesn't matter who does it. It's just a purely technical job, just like the person who carries the CD from the factory to Best Buy is the same, you right. know, just just anybody could do it. But then you yeah. learn more about this and you hear the before and after. That's the thing. You hear what comes in to the engineer and then what goes yeah. out. And it would blow so many people's minds to know how huge of a gap there is between input and output with an audio engineer. So there's also this component of like, these people need to be valued and they need their appreciation and they need to be seen for the artists that they are, which is something that I still very much harp on about and still believe. They're artists who deserve to be recognized. So being a part of that yeah. is very cool. It's interesting too, because, you know, you think of just like someone that is doing a task, but no, these are people that are really tapped in emotionally and creatively because otherwise you can't create the sonic vision and more importantly, the feeling and emotion, unless you're tapped into it, there's, there's a dis there's going to be a disconnect if you can't tap into that. But if you can, then you take that feeling and try to translate it into the mix. And, you know, you take your life experiences and put it into the work. I mean, if you think about it, like everyone has, you know, since, since they can, when they're growing up, they're listening to music. So all of that is affecting the decisions they're going to be making. If, if they learn certain instruments growing up, they might favor them. So they're going to bring that up more in the mix. And um, that's all a creative decision. And it's just amazing to see all of these different creatives being recognized and you know have a platform where uh, they can just go out with the world and share and. The amount of information that's out now, like if you go back to like the tw like 2009, 2010, like it, we're talking, I think, yeah. eight and six or seven. And, you know, the amount of, amount of tutorials that were out there yeah. is pretty non-existent. Like non if you wanted to how your favorite producer or DJ or something was making right. a certain sound, you just have to troubleshoot it and guess and, and like have uh, critical listening. But otherwise, you couldn't just put a YouTube and type in like, how to make a so-and-so base. All and right. now there's like a thousand tutorials. All and a lot, and a lot of the information was false as well. A lot of the stuff that people were saying was just wrong. <laughs> and they were presenting it as if it was fact. It was like, like everyone, this is the truth, yeah, but it's not. <laughs> but it's just, it's literally not. And your mixes will sound like garbage. But you know, so yeah, exactly. coming to the show, mass, I mean, 300 episodes is, is, speaks volumes to the commitment to doing a weekly show, right? It was every week. So yeah. how did it get more complex? You know, maybe just for people who are thinking about this as something that they want to do or might be interested in, give us some of like the nuts and bolts, what needs to happen for a show like this to exist? So for a show like this to, for a show like Consolos Place to exist, I mean, first and foremost, you need the platform. Um, you need to be able to, you need to be tied in with the community where people will actually want to come on the show because even if you have the show, um, it's not necessarily uh, a success or uh, a roadmap for success because there there were uh, there were other kind of like audio talk shows that happened after Pensado's Place was kind of like the behemoth and they ultimately stopped putting out episodes. So it's, I think one of the most important things is that the hosts need to have chemistry and from there it kind of just branches out. And, but like, if you want to get on like the technical aspect of it, I mean, you obviously need to set, you need correct lights. You need to, uh, basically have all the equipment. Like when we were, when the show 
when we were doing the full flex studio production, we had five 4K cameras all going into, um, I think it was a black magic switcher. And uh, then we also had all the lobs for each for each uh, guest or person on camera go into uh, pre sonas. I think it was a twenty four. It was a twenty four channel pre sonas board. Um, and but then, but then it's like so you have those two components, but then you also have teleprompters that need to happen. So you have to make sure the stuff you're saying in the week has been researched, has been thought about. If there's sponsors for the show, you have to basically make sure that all the initiatives for that week have been, you know, discussed. Nothing is missed. But, you know, once you tape the episode, to go back in and, and retape it, I mean, we have done it in the past, but it's not it's, it's not ideal by any no. standpoint. No, um, no, no. You'll get a hair and makeup person because if, when you're in front of heavy lights, um, you can get reflections. And if you want that, you know, supreme uh, kind of quality, mm -hmm. all the like, little details matter. And ultimately that's how we would get the final product. Um, at the end of each week's show, uh, we basically take the the dialogue, run it through Pro Tools, different ISO plugins. I mean, I would do the cleanup mix on it where we're doing like dialogue, uh, DSing, um, Dialogue, uh, reverb, uh, removal of reverb in the dialogue, any plosives, like I think it was D plosive, D click, and D noise. We use that religiously. Uh, sometimes you have to go into the spectral editor. If there's like a siren or something that came through, then you just have to, you know, draw that frequency out. Um, and then obviously, you know, finish that, get that ready to go. But then you transfer to the video side. And you also have to now make sure that all the graphics that you have are uh ready to go for the for the show i mean obviously there's graphics and stuff that we use during the production which would go on the video wall so that would be a whole prep of itself where <laughs> trying to get all the graphics for the talking points and make sure the the, the talent has sent in you know yeah. their headshots approved photos all that stuff like that um then finally there's like one of the steps that like I really geeked out on was the actual color correction of the episode where we're basically going um, hue by hue set or hue saturation luminance. And we're go literally going dial by dial on all three, all, on all three of those and making sure all the colors are looking right. It's popping out of the screen. And we wanted it to look like the best it could be almost yeah. like a Mr. Rogers uh, audio neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rogers audio neighborhood. That's wonderful. You know, and uh, here's here's yeah. a, a, a thought. So when people are listening to this, and it this is, it maybe speaks to the audio engineer's mentality, which is kind of a fascinating thing that I think about a lot. We're living in the TikTok generation where a lot of influencers, their whole thing is just dancing with their cell phone camera and their cell phone audio, right? So we're living in a world where a lot of people aren't doing production value where a lot of people have millions of followers and their only camera is their cell phone camera. But you're talking about five 4K cameras, a TV wall, a set, lighting, audio <laughs> capture with lavalier, the whole setup, mixing attention to detail. Now, some might say you don't have to do any of that. But yet, what is it about the certain individual that says we need to do this. <laughs> Why do some people feel compelled to go th to that limit with stuff? Yeah. I mean, I think it's probably a personal point of uh, pride and ego, <laughs> probably. On, on one hand, you could just be like, okay, cool. Let's get the bare minimum deliverables. Like, let's set up like a baseline. And as long as we hit the baseline, we're good. And then move on to the next. And, you know, many people do that. But maybe because I grew up with photography and you know Photoshop and just nerding out on colors that if my name was attached to it and I was you know putting so much effort into it, I wanted to make sure that I saw the whole process through and no matter what, that if anyone went to the show, the only reaction they could have would be, wow, like yeah. this is amazing. And you know, I wanted it to look 
I mean, this personally, like I wanted it to look the best that it could at all times. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a lot of times dialing in like micro movements with lights, you know, trying out different diffusions and really just uh, trying to make it the best, the best show possible. Because also as like a personal feeling, when at the end of the week, when the episode was up and I knew that all the steps were taken to make sure as good as possible, I could feel just, I could rest easy, be reassured and then be motivated to go back the next week and do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. But it's also probably a labor of love because there's certain aspects of the tech stuff, which I can just nerd out on and go into, which other people, they, they might just be like, bro, really? Do we need to do that? And be like, well, yeah, bro, we're going to do it. (laughs) Yep. So definitely, uh, that's probably a lot of like a nerd sensibility where I'm just like, right. I know we can get it there, so let's get it right. there. Some people have that, so, and yeah. some some people don't. It's fascinating to me. I mean, I have that, of course, but not everybody yeah. is built that way. I also I mean, obsess. Con- What's oh, that? You cut out. I was gonna say the content that you're putting out, like you're you're doing the exact same diligence. Like it's at such a high level and looks on point. Like everything from the lighting like how you're appearing on camera, the interstitial graphics you're using, the transition, <laughs> the choice, the color theory. I see you, I see you using like <laughs> the blues, the kind of Best Buy theme a little bit where it's, you know, <laughs> safe, family-friendly podcast. You're not using any bold colors. Or I mean, yeah. bold is a like very family, heartwarming, general, and trusted color. And, you know, you carry that through your personality as well where it's just like, oh yeah, like Ross, like, and, you know, people come on the show and they're just it's like a it's a warm place to be oh well thank you man i appreciate that a lot that means the world to me dude um hey. yeah it's it's just funny that 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 is the thing that motivates you you know it's it's all the same idea and and i what i really like about you is that it it's across disciplines because you see that the same thing that motivates you to make a vocal sound better, sweeter, cleaner, or a space more beautiful, or a song more amazing, is the same thing that motivates you to mess with the individual color wheels in the video, or to pick the certain camera that you might pick, right? Versus another camera, to pick the certain light, the diffusion, all of these things, they manifest themselves. And I think that's, that is the reason why I did this versus doing something just for audio. Because I thought, yeah. like, okay, I'll do a pod- I could do an audio podcast. I could be the audio guy. I thought about that. But then I thought, maybe people will come with me on this ride if we can see the things that link a lot of other things. Because it's true of business, social media, audio, like... How do things look? How do they feel? How do they sound? How do they taste? How do they smell? It's all the same thing. And we put boxes around them like, okay, you're an audio guy. You're a photographer. You are this or that or the other thing, or you're a chef and nothing else. But it's like some people just kind of want to do all of that stuff. And you're one of those people. You just want to be better across the board. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 think, I think a lot of it is I get bored eventually where I'm like, okay, I figured out how to do this thing in front of me and I I pushed it as far as I can push it. So, okay, now let me learn about this stuff. And it, it's just a way to uh, keep the brain busy. Because if, like, if I'm not doing something, then like the anxiety and stuff can like kick in, which is a whole different beast. So like in a weird way, like learning and geeking out and nerding is almost just like a safe zone where it's like, all right, yeah, cool. Let me just let me just dive in. You know, it's like the the latest endeavor has actually been. Uh, I mean, obviously, you got the music stuff that I'm like now coming full yep. circle on. With the music stuff, I reached a point where I was like, okay, I have to be able to have visuals with all this stuff, and I know video editing and that kind of stuff. But I was like, let me learn three D. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, like, exactly my point. Yeah. Uh, so for the last like. I mean, all through quarantine now, I've been like working inside Blender, basically just like coming up with different concepts and visuals and yeah, you know, I just and some of that it. stuff has been awesome. It's uh, 
I'm interested for sure, but I, I, you know, you're always scared to get into something because you know the rabbit hole goes deep. Yeah. Like my brother tried to get me into chess and I was like, I just can't do it. I can't get into chess because I know that if I get addicted, it'll kill me. I can't afford to be addicted to another thing right now. (laughs) Like you got the video, the audio, the guest talking. Are you still Rubik's Cubing? Yeah, oh, you know, I, I have probably six Rubik's Cube. I mean, not not professional. <laughs> but I, it's, a, you know, when I'm waiting for things to render, I always have a cube in my hand, of course. It's, I don't want to say a nervous tick, but something along the lines of a nervous tick. I can't I wait mean, for you... something and not just be sort of solving it in the background. Stupid. Your yeah. brain's like calculating. Must like... solve, must <laughs> compute. So, Your brain's yes. like a G. Yes, it is. It is. It is, and I've also noticed that if you're not busy on something, that you know you have to be busy, or the thoughts come in, and that's a like you said, a whole different episode, of course. But perfecting something is is important, and working towards a goal is important. I've realized that, so that's that self awareness piece. Um, I feel feel like when you're working towards a goal, it uh, you being bogged down and you're not really sure where you're kind of navigating like if you were in the lake or something you're just kind of like floating and chilling yep. but you know it's a person being on a boat and you're like all right we're going across the lake we're at this right. port and we got to get to that port and then it's like a, a clear vision of the destination but otherwise you end up just kind of like floundering yep and i think i know enough about myself now to know that you know, just like everybody, it's hard for me to get started or hard to get motivated sometimes, but I'm old enough that I know that as hard as it is for me to start something or to do something or to keep doing something, if I do nothing, the pain after the fact of that will be worse. So like the pain of starting something is less than the pain of being a week later and having done nothing that week. So that's, that's the thing that propels you forward. And yeah, you know, I, I know you're the same way because, again, you don't get to 300. Like, that's that's a tremendous – you have done some insane things over a very long period of time. I mean, how many years – how long was that whole thing? Seven years about. Seven years. Okay, yeah, that's a long time. Yeah, I think and, 2012 or 2012 when I started with them. And yeah. uh, February of 2019 is where I decided to kind of uh, start yeah. the next chapter. With. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, seven years is a long time to do anything. Well, what, what are, uh, what are some of the lessons learned? Give me some lessons. <laughs> what are some lessons learned? <laughs> what did you learn after seven years of, of doing this every week that you wish you knew at the beginning or just general stuff? That's very interesting. Um, <clears throat> I, I would say, Try to try not to overthink things. Like keep it keep it simple. Um, I mean, obviously, staying focused. I mean, these are extremely generalized, but just from like the core concept of it, those have uh, really helped uh, streamline things. Um, remember, remember, remember to breathe in, 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 in a lot of in a lot of situations where you just like like all right, take a deep breath. Because sometimes, I mean, I've definitely I can definitely be prone to it where I might lose track of my breathing and it's like oh wait i didn't I'm, I'm like feeling anxious and I'm, I'm realizing i didn't take a breath like the last like 15 20 30 seconds and it's like oh well yeah if i breathe um give yourself more time than you anticipate um and you know once you've given yourself enough time on a lot of occasions then you can kind of uh you're like okay this will be a lot more streamlined but in the beginning you definitely want to give yourself more time um it's okay to make mistakes it's all like a, a learning process and you end up kind of laughing about them after the fact granted at least, as long as the magnitude of your mistake isn't like career altering <laughs> which but, it can be which it, it very well can be i mean yeah uh, yeah exactly okay so yeah you know, there's there's uh, another or oh, go ahead please If I if I if I'm if I'm trying to drop some gems, yes, we feed off the gems. Hold on, let me pull up. 
Let me just pull a gem out of my uh, rabbit gem. hat. <laughs> His gem hat. He's got a top so, hat, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, just boys and girls. Yes. All oh, missing bow tie. Okay, so out of the actual gems, I would say just be nice to people, really. Like, like be the version of yourself that, you know, you would be impressed with meeting. Um, you don't you don't know the days people have been having, and like every week when we'd have people come to the show, it was basically like a, a social experiment would be the wrong word, but um, you know you have a bunch of people coming in from everywhere around the world, and then you have to basically get everyone in a really good mood and kind of forget about you know whatever stuff they might have been going through. Um, so just being nice to people, you know, generally being interested about them, making them laugh. Um, I feel like if you, I feel like a lot of doors open in life just by being like a good person and have energy that people naturally gravitate towards. Like if you're always fun to be around, fun to hang out with, or just like a good hang, then the other doors and the other stuff that these individuals might be doing you know, since they like being with you, they're like, oh, well, I know so-and-so does this and I have this. Let me see if they want to be a part of this. And then all of a sudden you're like, I'm down. Yeah, like, of course, let's do it. <laughs> so that's, um, that'd probably be the biggest, biggest takeaway. I mean, there's, there's so many things you learn about the technical stuff along the way as well, but that's more just about like being diligent and like, you know, like crossing the T's, dotting the I's. Yeah. Well, there's, you have experienced something that very few people can say that they have. And as YouTube gets older, we're going to see this more and more, but we're going to see more and more people on the other side of a YouTube career, either as content creators or as channels. And I think yeah. when you're in the early stages of something, you just see the growth like the internet, YouTube, anything that's new. It's just growth, 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 growth. After seven years or 10 years, you hit the limits of growth. And how do you deal with that? How did you deal with that towards the end where you say like, hey, maybe some of the most recent episodes don't have as many plays as some of the episodes that we had five years ago? What, what, what was the thought process going through your head as, as things changed over time? Yeah. I mean, so if we would see, if, if there would be some, uh, view, if there would be like a, a drop in viewership, for example, um, I mean, it could be a, a bunch of different, different reasons. So we tried not to uh, focus too much on that. I mean, obviously we've taken the, the variables where, or take the variables into consideration where it's like, okay, this episode didn't do too well what's what's the reason okay and then you know the first thing i'm thinking about is you know like the pacing of the show like you take the whole hour block how was it segmented um how was the guests themselves were they forthcoming with information and generally part of the conversation or were they kind of just like chilling in the armchair and you know answering questions and being short um how was the how was the engagement of the guest from a social media standpoint, were they posting the episode, were they tagging it, were they doing all that stuff? Is the person, is the, ta is the guest that was on the show, sorry, the guest that was on the show, how large is their fan base? Are they gonna naturally send traffic? Um, so like, you know, if we would do an episode with Noah yeah. 40 should be the shout out 40, Miss Met. Um, that those episodes would go uh, completely viral just because everyone wants to know everything that he is doing, <laughs> and rightfully so. Um, but then, if you have other other people on the show that might be um, earlier in their careers or might not have the same level of hype, then obviously those numbers would be lower because people people aren't as inclined to find out what the person's doing right away, where it's like, okay, they see the guests are like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll watch it. But then you have some shows where it's just like, 
I got to figure out. I, I got to listen to this right now so I yeah. can absorb any of the that he has and apply them to the work that I now have ahead of me. Mm. Yep. And and has yeah. your relationship to social media changed since you began? Do you are you still optimistic about it? Do you still believe in it, or are you getting sick of it? What do you feel these days? Okay, that's a good question. So I feel like so my, my relationship with social media is interesting because if we if we rewind the clocks to like let's go all the way back to MySpace days. Um, I was in middle school, steam kid, long emo hair with the pop back and everything. And um, I'm like 12, 13 years old. And I had a following of like 47,000 people. So, so, and then when MySpace kind of shut down and, you know, I lost all, all of that count and stuff. Kind of even by high school, I like was over the social media thing where I was like, okay, I had built the platform once when I was really young. Um, and I, I felt like it was like a checkbox done where I almost like didn't need to do it again. Obviously now we're coming full circle where I'm releasing music as Seagor and putting stuff forward where it's like, okay, let's build the brand back up. Um, but I feel like we're definitely almost like, it's like V3 of the internet where it's like you, or at least like social media, like you had True. MySpace, all that stuff as being like V1. Then you had like Instagram and Facebook V2. And now you have TikTok being like V3. And ultimately, I don't know what V4 is going to be. Because mm. I feel like the generations that are growing up also now have, you know, different interests. And I feel like yeah. the rela being relatable is getting harder and harder and then there's also there's always like the age-old question where it's like is there a certain age where you should stop dancing on tiktok <laughs> if you're not if you're not, if you're not like a, if you're not like a professional dancer and that other is your career like I, I i don't know like at what age does it go from like acceptable to like man, like you're grown, you're, like you're being corny. <laughs> like, right. like, so that's been uh, an interesting uh, kind of blend. It's like maybe, maybe before of the internet is where we're all kind of on like VR goggles or augmented mm -hmm. reality. And then our communication to the internet is not actually through like a, a tangible computer. Like a computer just might be part of the ecosystem that we live in, you know? Yep. It's, uh, I do. Yeah. I don't know. I it's do. interesting because then you make like Instagram and all those things. Yeah. And it's like, it's become such a pay to play thing, oh, which on one social media companies, you're making so much money because you know, if you want to reach your whole audience, you have to basically pay for that. And you're like, yep. yeah, you're just like spitting out money. And you're like, mm -hmm. wait, I spent money to build this audience on your platform. And now you want me to spend yep. money to reach the audience that I built on your platform. And yes. if I don't pay enough, it's not going to go to them, even though I was the one responsible. Correct. And so it's, I yep. feel like it just got extremely diluted and, Here's your controversial bit. A little bit ass backwards. <laughs> mm. Where it's like, if I build a brand, I mean, obviously every brand has to spend marketing dollars, whether it's Ralph sending you their latest sales in the mail or, you know, you get emails or something like that. Like there's still an effort of marketing that has to go into it. But the yeah. whole in a play concept of, to your fans, I just, I don't know. It just, like for those for those of people that want to like you know drop 30 40 50 Gs on building the audience amazing but for everyone else that's starting out it's like i almost don't know if the i don't know how the like long term plays are now mm. because the climate is so much different and i feel like there's a lot more competition mm -hmm. but then at the same time you take all the competition and added interest and then you could argue like okay because there's more stuff out there more people are consuming content 
So there's less of a barrier for someone to be, to like resist picking up your content. You know, if someone's already listening to five podcasts, they're going to be like, well, hey, let me check this one out too. Mm. And it just kind of keep going from there. And it obviously is up to each individual creator to like, you know, maintain the brand and the business and all that stuff. But I don't know. It's uh, it's interesting. I might've gotten a little bit of a tangent circle there and, no, it's dead weird. End, I agree. And looking at TikTok was, uh, when I first installed that app, it was a shock, honestly. Just seeing what was going on there. It felt like discovering a foreign language for the first time. You're aware that a language is being spoken, but you just don't know what the language is saying. And it felt to me a lot like, like hive mind, like science, science fiction, you know, where there are races of people or, you know, uh, alien races that are hive mind, they're collective. I think it's Ender's Game, various sci-fi books. And you see somebody who's like, here is a dance move that I do. And then you just see the waves of hundreds of thousands of people doing the same dance. And you're like, on the one hand, that's really cool that we're connecting to each other in this weird way. But on the other hand, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? And why is it that Mucinex can recommend a dance and a million people are going to do the Mucinex dance with zero self-consciousness whatsoever? They're just totally fueling this corporation with it. And it's just like, okay, this is what we're doing now, I guess. This is life now. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's almost like if a new TikTok dance comes out, People, I think, almost look at it like a potential lotto ticket where it's like, okay, this dance is going right. viral. If I do if I do this dance and post it, yeah. I'm putting in my lotto ticket to the TikTok yeah. algorithm gods. So please bless me with followers. <laughs> like Right. Yes, it's a lotto ticket. You know, and so you've got like these everyone people was- as well. Like the the notion of quality. And I think this speaks to the earlier point about, you know, you, you spend so much time trying to build something of quality. And there are people trying to do this, whether it's Disney or, you know, the Mandalorian, people out there trying to build quality things. And then you've got, you know, TikTok, which is just sort of inherently a low quality medium just by its very nature. And you've got people getting rich making low quality things who are probably categorically against high quality things. I saw an interview yeah. with this kid who he made a, a beat, like a seven second beat that went viral on TikTok. So, of course, he got like a million plus, maybe 10 million Spotify plays, and he was building a little career for himself. And it's the kind of beat that you could make in about 30 seconds. You know, if you had Fruity Loops version one, you could make this beat in about 30 seconds. But because it went viral, he had the same ego. And and in the interview, he was talking unironically about working with Max Martin and some of like the greatest producers that have ever lived. And I was thinking to myself, the gap between what you're able to do and, like, what Prince did is so massive, you know? But, like, in your mind, you're just right there. And who are we to say otherwise, right? Because it's like, he's making the money, he's more successful. So it's just this, gosh, I wish there was a better term for this, but there isn't. I'm just going to censor it later. But it's this mind fuck where you're kind of doubting all of your taste and sensibility, where it's almost like good taste things are punished. Yeah. It's, and it's interesting for sure. Then on the flip side, you could be like, well, other people have made seven second beats or something, but they didn't go viral. So like, <laughs> so maybe, so he, he knows what he's saying. Maybe, about. maybe, maybe he just had the secret sauce for the seven second beat. Like maybe yeah. that's the tr- thing where we just got to like learn how to make, yeah. Beats like as short as possible where like right. the beats are just like one second, you just get one sound, like, <laughs> like and that's it. <laughs> that's my trademark. But, like it's that's an arpeggio or like one second. <laughs> Brilliant. That's, there's your NFT right there. <laughs> that's, right. The whole awesome the whole game trauma. is changing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's it. It's it, yeah, it's it, keeping track of it. It's but and you know, as we live more and more for the algorithms, there's also it's like how much do you do in service of an algorithm versus how much is original thought? And that is something that I think we must all keep in mind as content creators, as people, you know, because nobody ever asked for the greatest works of art to be made. Nobody said, do this. You know, they did it from some other source. They might say God or inspiration or whatever. There was something else that led them to make something. And then it became whatever. And, I feel like if we get too dictated by the algorithm, 
I do this because it works or I'm going to only make seven second beats now because I want to get viral on TikTok. There's something about that that feels sad to me, I suppose. Well, it's it's kind of like you, you're kind of being put in a corner of the content that you need to create because on, on the flip side, you could, I mean, like, yeah, like the, the algorithm is, the algorithm is almost, is almost like the end all be all here because yep. if you make all this original content and the algorithm's like, man, then, you know, it'll, it just kind of goes to like the archive and like, obviously when people like go back on the profile and stuff, they see like this treasure chest of content, but it's like, okay, when is the algorithm going to be like, or when is when is the algorithm going to give you like the two thumbs up where it's like, you go dude. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. You got one. So, yeah. Versus, you know, doing stuff that's like designed for the algorithm. Mm-hmm. That's like, uh, I mean, it's almost like two different ways of thinking about content creation all, all together, where right. it's like right. one is something that is true to you and you really enjoy, and then you hope others will, t- will take from it. And then others, or like the, the other side of the coin is just having content that is designed to reach. Like every aspect of the video from the ground up is thought about from the engagement, you know, keep, keep, keeping people's attention to the surprise moments. How long yep. is the overall duration? Where are we having the sponsor card segment? Or not sponsor card, but just like the sponsor thank moment yep. for this video, which is a new trend where it's like the viewer, you know, you, you do the video and then halfway through the video, you're like, but wait, I want to thank the sponsors of the video. Yeah. Me my VPN. <laughs> yeah. So it's, I'm sponsoring uh, my own podcast now. I should yeah, be interrupting this with my commercial break. I'm going to put a commercial break right here. Blink. And we're back. Now it's <laughs> Ross podcast. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now it's oh, man. Yeah, it's it's. It, I completely agree about the two different modes of content we're seeing that, and of course, the more cynical people tend to win out. The people who design a YouTube channel specifically for growth, and that that is an interesting point because you have to be sort of cynical. And I've all this was something that I realized about music. Because I was able to build brands and do this thing with marketing for other people and not caring about it on an emotional level made it easier to succeed, I feel. Now, with music, it was always such an intensely personal thing for me that there was never a world where I could separate the art from the numbers or do something for a cynical reason. It was just literally impossible. And the negative side of that is if somebody criticizes a thing you make in music, it just killed me because it's like you're insulting me. That's who I am. It's not a thing I made. It's me that you don't like, you know? And Yeah, like you don't so, like the creation I made, you don't like me. Yeah, exactly, because this is me. <laughs> right. And this that is, is something art. that I noticed, that I noticed that, that – you, it takes a special kind of person to separate themselves to say like, okay, I'm going to make the most cynical YouTube channel ever. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to make a kid's channel for toddlers age two to four. You know, like if I wanted to get a billion views, that's what I would do. I'd make a kid's channel for toddlers aged two to four because that's how it happens. Yeah. Nobody's watching Conan O'Brien 400 times in a row in a single day, as brilliant as he is. Uh, <laughs> but, you want- my daughter is watching the same video 400 times in a row, just again and again and again and again and again. Oh, my God. Wait, really? Oh, yeah. Like, she has favorites on YouTube kids that are just... It's like, do you ever get sick of this? I mean, we're talking about days and weeks and months. Uh, just the same. Oh, yeah. She'll just... She'll she'll end up back on the same video. It's wild. She She seeks it out. There are certain videos that you just hear over and over again. Yeah, like kids are insanely attached to stuff. I mean, it's a really weird experiment, but it's true. That's going to be interesting as they get older. Like, you know, obviously we have all the shows growing up that, you know, we watch and stuff like that. And, you know, obviously I think probably a good amount of them are on YouTube. But our our remembering of them is watching from the TV or VHS or something. So it's like, how are they going to... You, the, the same content they grew up with obsessively right. that they, they're going to be able to go back and like watch that exact episode yep. and then all 
But the, the interesting That's thing my- is, you know, we're running low on time here, but what one of the biggest cultural shifts is that we had a shared reference point, for better or for worse. You know, there was so many channels on TV. Johnny Carson was the late night host. Everybody knew what he talked about. There were a couple channels, and after a certain hour, there was one channel or two, right? there. So we all had a shared reference point. You get to work. What are you going to talk about? The same thing. Everybody has their own little thing now on YouTube. So my daughter's reference point will not be the same as many of her friends. Like, you know, in my generation, it was The Simpsons and, you know, earlier like Jeopardy, various cultural icons that everybody knew about. Then the later generation became like SpongeBob and it became Pokemon. And, you know, it it changed, but there was still a shared touching point. And now it's like, it's all your individual TikTok creator who somebody else might know, but they might not. So there's no like, you, yeah. you know, they're not, you're not going to get together in 40 years and be like, hey, you remember that SpongeBob episode? And they're going to say, oh, boy, do I ever. It's like an intensely you know personal experience. Extremely personal. I mean, you, you just, uh, you just uh, I triggered a thought. It's like, you, you remember when we were younger and the sense of, you know, seeing someone on TV was this giant kind of unknown. You're like, wow, like, wow. who is that person on the screen? Like, how did they do that? All that yeah. stuff. You learn how to make content and everything, and you're like, oh, okay, I, it's just a person in front of a camera that's being displayed on a monitor. <laughs> right. But imagine younger generation, like, are they gonna, you know, like how we would watch movies or something growing up, and we yeah. would kind of like glorify those people really young. Are the people that are the people that are really young on TikTok gonna like glorify the TikTok creators and almost perceive them as, like, I don't know. Uh, not like a holy figure, but just like hold them to a higher like light and standard because they kind of grew up with them before they could really discern like what it was. Like, I don't know, do kids understand now that, that like they're watching videos on their phone or are they just kind of seeing what's there? It's, it's interesting. I don't know. It's very confusing. All I can tell you is that if you look up statistically the channels that have the most views by far... If you're looking at billion plus view videos, kids, all kids stuff. And, you know, because they obsess, they idolize, they, you know, here's, and I think to some degree the TikTok, yeah, they are the new celebrities, right? To some degree for sure. So it's a weird world. We're becoming dinosaurs. The tech guys, (laughs) we're becoming obsolete. (laughs) All right, so let's end this episode by doing the Mucinex dance. Do you have a cough? Let's do a dance. Just kidding. No, but uh, <laughs> I, I shouldn't have even said the brand. I feel dirty already. Um, but all right, life lessons learned. It's been a really fun chatting with you as always. Life lessons learned. So for people out there who want to consider a career in digital anything, digital stuff, digital guy like you, what advice do you have? Um. Make sure it's something that you're passionate about. Make sure that you generally enjoy it, not just something that um, you think would be cool, because otherwise you're not going to have the same attention to detail. And you might not also go as far because it's just, uh, there's a lot of roadblocks and there will be a lot of setbacks and you have to be able to kind of just like take all the bumps and bruises along the way. Um, But, you know, being able to create something and put it out digitally for everyone to consume and then having people consume it and then tell you how much they enjoyed it is an extremely rewarding feeling. And being able to know that you've changed people's lives along the way, it's like, I mean, like the principle of like passing it forward just goes, uh, just gets echoed really. So That's beautiful sentiment, man. And the last thing, best, Best piece of advice you've ever received? Breathe. <laughs> Full stop. Okay. Man, well, yeah. uh, you know, as, as always, it's been a pleasure. Um, real quick, tell everybody where they can follow you, check out your music and what you're up to. Yeah, so uh, all the socials are basically Sigor, Instagram slash Sigor. Go to Spotify, type in Sigor. On Twitter, it's I'm Sigor, uh, C-E-G-O-R. Brand new single um, about you out on Spotify streaming now. Go check it out. Um, 
and I've got a lot more music and drum and bass and creative stuff in the works. So, awesome. Man. Well, when I, when I'll be able to share it. Very cool. Well, thank you very much. Obviously, you and I could talk for hours and hours on end about life, the universe, and everything. But I really, yeah, it's been good. great to have you on the show. Um, I think you're, you have done some really cool things, and I, I hope that uh, people take note of some of the awesomeness that you bring. Oh, well, I appreciate that, man. I have oh, to dude. turn it back. You're, uh, you're killing it. What, what, what episode number is this? This will be 21. number 26. I think, oh, yeah, nice. maybe 27. Season three, season three, oh, baby. Okay. <laughs> I'm doing 12 episode season. Yep. Why? Nice. Simpsons, that's why, because I grew up with the Simpsons. Like that 12 episodes, you must switch seasons, <laughs> whatever that means. So yeah, season dude, three, just... cool. Exactly. Everything's different. Man, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, man. And with that, the podcast is officially over thanks for listening to the beat the often path podcast if you've been enjoying this show please like comment share subscribe on apple Podcasts. subscribe to me on youtube it would mean the world to me also do you have an unusual success story or do you know someone who does well please recommend them to me they could be a future guest on this show maybe they've rolled the largest boulder down the mountains of tibet or maybe they built the world's largest chicken farm in Madagascar. The point is, I don't know what I don't know, so I'm looking for inspiration and unusual success stories. So help me by being a part of this adventure. I'm looking to grow this podcast with you. Thanks again for listening.